Welcome, everyone. Pleased to have you here with us today for our, I believe it's our 56th episode of This is CDR. Welcome, everyone. Pleased to have you here with us today for our, I believe it's our 56th episode of This is CDR. This is CDR as an online event series presented by OpenAir to explore the range of carbon removal solutions currently being researched, developed, and deployed, and to contextualize them, and specifically just really to contextualize them for policy proposals OpenAir is working and seeking to advance at every level of government here in the United States, as well as in national and subnational jurisdictions globally. Um, my name is Toby Bryce. I work on uh, Carbon Removal Policy Act advocacy and market development for open air. Um, if you haven't already, I'm based in Brooklyn, New York. If you haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat. Make sure you're directing your message to everyone and tell us where you're zooming in from and if you want to your, your affiliation professionally. Um, open air, uh, just some quick background on us. We're a distributed uh, volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of carbon removal solutions essential to solving the climate crisis. We're a global community. Um, we work together on shared what we call open source missions in the areas of research and development, um, messaging and communications, policy advocacy, and as I mentioned, activist market development. Uh, our co-founder, Chris Neidl, who's running the chat, just put a link in the chat to a join form, and you basically fill that out, and we will invite you onto our Discord server, which is a which is a platform like Slack that we use to communicate and organize our projects. So tons of fun projects to work on. You can start your own projects, and we'd love to have you be part of what we're doing here at Open Air. Before we start today's program, which we're super excited about, um, we always like to provide a little bit of context in terms of uh, the definition of what we're talking about. Um, this here is a definition of carbon removal pulled directly from the carbon dioxide removal primer, which is a fantastic resource that uh, is available for free online. Um, about 60 uh, researchers, academics, practitioners contribute to putting it together, and it's a great background for carbon removal. Um, the definition is perfect purposeful human activity to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and durably store it in geological, terrestrial, or ocean reservoirs or in long-lived products. Um, there are two really important things to call out when we talk about CDR. Number one, CDR is distinct from what's typically called carbon capture, quote unquote, or CCS, um, which typically refers to capturing CO2 from an emission source, whether it's a natural gas power plant or a cement plant. Um, this may or may not be a good and positive climate solution, depending on the specific context, socioeconomic, techno-economic, environmental justice, et cetera. But one thing it's absolutely not is carbon removal, which is, again, a dedicated human activity to pull CO2 out from the atmosphere and durably store it. Number two, when we talk about carbon removal, it's really important to, to be very clear up front that carbon removal is in no way, shape, or form any sort of substitute for reducing emissions. Um, we need to reduce our emissions, decarbonize our global economy as quickly and as completely as possible, full stop. That said, there's clear scientific consensus uh, expressed, I think, most clearly in the most recent IPCC AR6 Working Group 3 report report that carbon removal will be required at gigaton scale by mid-century. That's billions of tons per year um, if we want to have any chance of limiting warming to 1.5 or even 2 degrees um, Celsius. Um, and the reason for that is that, <clears throat> as I said, we need to reduce emissions as quickly as possible, but there are some emissions that are going to be impossible to, um, to eliminate in the climate-relevant time frame, either for just functional reasons like the agricultural sector. We're not going to be, be able to completely decarbonize the agricultural sector in the next 20 or 30 years. And additionally, for equity reasons, you know, developing nations are not going to be able to decarbonize as quickly as the developed world should be able to. So for those reasons, we are going to need carbon removal at gigaton scale by mid-century. Um, additionally, in the second half of the century, we have trillions of tons of anthropogenic CO2 in the atmosphere that we are going to need to remove to be able to have a safe and healthy climate for future generations. Um, so carbon removal is essential. It is part of our climate toolkit alongside reducing emissions, which we really have to focus on and, and, and make sure that we're not, um, not, not slacking on in any way, and additionally um, adapting to our already changed climate. So carbon removal, emissions reduction, and adaptation are, are the three key legs of climate action. Um, I'm going to um, pass it over to my colleague, Megha Raghavan, now, who's going to talk a little bit about run of show, and she's also going to introduce today's uh, speakers. 
Hey everyone, I'm Mega. I am an open air member, uh, normally based in London, although I'm currently in California um, and working on policy advocacy as well. Um, so as usual, we're going to have a short, short presentation to start off with, followed by a few prepared questions and then moderated audience Q&A. So if you have any questions along the way, please type them into the Zoom Q&A box. Um, it's separate from the chat box, so make sure you find the right one to help us organize the questions. Um, the event's being recorded, so we'll send the video link out to everyone who registered, and we will also post it to OpenAir's website and to our YouTube channel. Um, this week, we're very pleased to welcome Pebble co-founders Andreas Sari and Paul Knops, who will tell us about the new company's innovative method that employs mineralization to combine CO2 with abundant minerals to create carbon-negative industrial raw materials. Andreas is the co-founder and co-CEO of Pebble, and formerly Andreas co-founded the 280 company, which developed conversion processes for CO2 and for methane um, into carbon nanomaterials. Prior to that, he was the CEO of Slush, which you can find at www.slush.org, and the co-founder and CEO of Wave Ventures, which is at www.wave.ventures, if you're interested in that. Um, Andreas studied industrial engineering and management at Aalto University in Finland. Paul is the co-founder and CTO of Pebble and has been working on mineralization for about 15 years, first as an academic interest. Paul slowly realized that besides the CO2 sequestration, there is value to be uh, generated from the beneficial use of the end products. And so in order to create an influential impact, this needs to be scaled up to an industrial scale, which requires founding a company, a bigger team, more funding, and more business cases beyond just the chemistry of the CO2 sequestration. Um, and Paul has an MSc degree in physics from the University of Trenton. So uh, over to you when you guys are ready to present. Good. Thanks, Mega. Thanks, um, Toby and Chris and everyone else. Uh, great to be here. Let me just get the slides up and ready to go. So here we go. Uh, Pebble um, is a fairly young company. We consider ourselves a restored carbon company, which uh, is, is a bit of a word monster, but we essentially take captured carbon dioxide, whether it comes from direct air captured um, sources or industrial emission sources, we take that CO2 and we permanently mineralize it, but we don't put it underground, we turn it into a usable powder form that is essentially an existing commodity mineral product that has demand on the order of hundreds of millions of tons or billions of tons every single year in some of the largest industries on the planet. So essentially, we're serving kind of as a bridge between what to do with the CO2 once you've captured the CO2 and how to decarbonize and make CO2 storing rather than CO2 emitting some of the largest, you know, largest volume materials and commodities that we have uh, on this particular planet. And let's dive a little more into what mineralization really is, just to bring everyone onto the same page. And this is over to you, Paul. Thank you, uh, Andreas. Let me talk briefly about mineralization. I'm sure most people heard about mineralization. Mineralization can be done at ambient way. That is uh, putting alkaline rocks and then wait. And then uh, typically you need to wait, let's say, 30, 200 years. And then slowly sequester CO2. There's nothing wrong with that. But of course, that goes a bit slow. My background is physics. So the reaction is, for, is, is described here. This is the reaction. This uh, you produce energy. That means that the magnesium carbonate is a lower energy form, therefore, therefore permanently stored. And you see, you need yeah, olivine rocks, either calcium or uh, magnesium silicate rocks, and then your form products. That is uh, can be done either at yeah, like I said, ambient type of things. Uh, I'm sure most of you heard about Project Vesta. And that uh, is nothing wrong with that, but then you need to wait quite some time. So I, when I started looking into that, being honestly, like I explained 15 years ago, I thought, okay, this can be done faster. My background is physics. And there was some literature in the States from the Department of Energy. And if you increase the temperature, increase the pressure, then things are going much faster. Instead of waiting 10 years, I'm not sure how, how many years, 60 million minutes are, but at least quite some years, you can do it within, within one hour. And that's something I'll be working on. And therefore, yeah, the reaction goes much faster, which is, of course, advantages. But later on, I found out we also make products where you can use beneficially. So you see the advantage is you use ambient rocks, which is, I think, known, but also besides faster, we can manufacture carbonates which have beneficial use and that's i think the next slide oh it's coming right so, after this okay sorry sorry 
<laughs> so, the, so, uh, so this industrial process, and in order to make the CO two negative or CO two neutral, we can use the CO two uh, uh, from deck from deck companies, like Andreas explained. The deck companies they are producing CO two at this moment they are bound to the geological sequest, uh, locations where they can either inject the CO two, which is then permanent removal. I'm sure you all heard about Iceland and about Climeworks. Or they can use the CO2 for non-permanent uses, but then of course it's not negative emissions. So that is one of the advantages using DEC. A second CO2 source can be biogenic CO2. Uh, and then biogenic, you can think about waste treatment installations where they burn waste, which is typically half biogenic. Or if you have biogas in Holland, more and more biogas is upgraded to natural gas. And that means as a byproduct, you get the CO2. So therefore, the CO2 sourcing, I usually say, isn't our major concern. We are talking to some deck companies to integrate our process with their process. We're talking to waste handling companies to get their CO2 to us. So that's the front side. The olivine is an abundant mineral. Uh, in uh, Europe, it is available in uh, Norway, uh, Italy, Spain, and some other countries. So that is not the problem, this, the, the, the problem of sourcing either. And now looking at the main benefits is, as I explained here, this permanent. So it is, there is no risk of reversing. And uh, that we are making our carbonate and not putting it back to the landfill. We are act actively looking for beneficial uses of this product and thereby uh, also earning money by selling this product, but also from a sustainable point of view, we are resulting in less line uh, mining as we are producing our own line. So that's the co-benefit, the raw materials we explained. The energy requirement, this is an extremic post reaction. And uh, we so that is beneficial. We need some electric energy to pressurize the system, but that's with all due respect, more than DTS. Yes. So that's also, I think, very positive on our side. It is net negative, the C2 is permanently removed, and we are using uh, yeah, uh, existing equipment in the oil and gas industry. We need high pressure, uh, reasonable modest temperatures, which are common used in the oil and gas industry. So therefore, and I'm very happy that we co-founded the company Pebble uh, close to one year ago, so we can scale up to this, these, these, these developments. I would like to give the word back to Andreas, Thanks, Paul. Um, so to, to take a little bit of a deeper dive and a closer look at what you can actually do with these materials once you are producing them. So th the world is consuming something like on the order of more or less 10 billion tons of mineral products per year. I might have got that number a little bit wrong. Most of it is uh, sand. Um, much of it is limestone going into a number of different applications. Uh, a lot of limestone go, goes into cement. The world, world is producing something like 4 billion tons of cement every single year, which causes almost the same amount of uh, CO2 emissions in terms of gigatons. So that's uh, obviously a very large market in terms of volume. However, limestone, which practically in this case, uh, our comparable product is the magnesium carbonate or calcium carbonate that comes out of the process, is also used in other large-scale applications like paper and polymers. Paper typically involves... Uh, lime, whether it's ground limestone or precipitated calcium carbonate to serve as a functional filler to provide certain properties or to drive down the cost uh, of the paper. The same goes for polymers. And um, where we are with these uh, products and applications is we're working with outside experts in optimizing the recipes so that we could get to a point of actual drop in replacement of the currently used lime with a carbon negative or CO2 storing alternative that comes out of our process. And when it comes to the feasibility of scaling up this uh, particular technology, obviously, you know, the, the challenge and the opportunity for the world and for our company at the same time is, you know, moving from producing materials that cause a huge amount of CO2 emissions to producing materials that can store CO2 and can help store CO2. And this can be done. Traditionally, when you've looked at what to do with the CO2, if you achieve permanent sequestration and you put it underground, you lose the valuable raw material that CO2 is. It's literally carbon and oxygen, which you find everywhere. And at the same time, if you wanted to turn CO2 upgraded into a value uh, or higher value product, typically either you have to put in a lot of energy and or 
you will get a product such as a chemical or a fuel that is very valuable and infinitely better than a fossil counterpart, but still will result in a re-emission at the end of its life cycle. So CO2 mineralization and running that in an industrial reactor on the ground at the site of CO2 being captured makes it possible to achieve simultaneously permanent sequestration of CO2 and utilization in materials and decarbonizing those materials. Um, very quickly, where we are with the company. So we, we set up about a year ago uh, with four uh, co-founders. The other two, in addition to Paul and myself, are quite experienced. Marta Sjögren, my co-founder and co-CEO, spent the last 12 years in venture capital, most formerly as a partner at North Zone, where she left uh, to fully focus on climate. And our founding chair, Jane Wallerud, is a one of the most successful serial entrepreneurs and investors in, in Northern Europe. Uh, she serves as very much a full-time chair in our founding team. The team is roughly eight people right now. We closed a first funding round of about 8 million euros in February this year from leading climate tech investors. There's one called Pale Blue Dot out of Sweden, another French one called 2050, and the Grantham Foundation out of the United States. What we're doing with that money, quite simply, is taking the first steps in going down the cost curve to be able to scale up this technology. And in our case, that means that first we move from batch operation, which has been proven on multiple different scales, to a continuous flow operation. And for that, we're currently engineering and next year building the first pilot plant, uh, likely in the, in the Netherlands. At the same time, we're producing enough of the material with the or existing batch equipment to do product development and to prepare the market for the adoption of this material. And the third major stream is further R&D into how to accelerate the kinetics in our process and make it even more uh, efficient. That's uh, it for a quick overview. We're trying to stick to the stick to the time limit. Happy to dive deeper into any of the particular areas, but hopefully this can serve as a starting point for shedding more light on, onto this particular solution. Fantastic. Thank you, Andreas and Paul. This is an excellent um, starting point for discussion. Um, we have a few prepared questions from Open Air that we've crowdsourced from our community. Um, and uh, audience, please, um, uh, I don't know if we have too many yet, but please put your questions in the Zoom Q&A box. Um, I think, you know, happy to get into more detail um, on, on some of these questions. Um, just, uh, we always like to start uh, the prepared Q&A just with a little bit of a maybe a little bit of each of your personal histories uh, in terms of how you came to climate, start, first became aware of the climate issue, how you got to carbon removal, and then specifically with respect to Pebble, how the founders met and came together and formed the company. Um, would love to hear that from um, from each of you guys. Paul, you should go first. Shall I go first? Shall I fill the yes. half an hour? <laughs> <laughs> now, the, my background is physics, and I happen to know all of Sperling since uh, 25 or not, even longer, 40 years. My first experience with Olaf Schoeling was when we had our sewage truck, sewage truck treatment plant and he came over to our facility with a bug of a big shit. That was my first meeting of Olaf Schoeling. And Olaf Schoeling is well known in the enhanced weathering community, promoting olivine for beaches, for civil applications for a very long time. And uh, then about, uh, I always had a contact with him and then about 15 years ago, I looked more into depth into that. And then I realized there are two ways of looking at the olivine, either at the ambient guys, and that means that you, there's nothing wrong with that, putting in civil applications or project FESTA, these kind of things, or looking at more from a physics chemistry point of view and increasing the reaction rate. So that's when I want, uh, so that's when I thought, okay, let's look for the second one. Uh, I did first some research at the University of Leuven, made quite some publications, some people did their masters and some PhDs about that, then later on with Aachen. And then I always had a problem that I realized my next phase, you're talking about high pressure equipment, which is very capital intensive. Uh, of course, 10 years ago, climate change was very low on the agenda. So I had for a very long time struggling to find the right people to fight the right funding to bring this to the next level, realizing that it's very capital intensive equipment. So then about slightly more than one year ago, I was approached by uh, Jane, Marta and Andreas. As they were looking at from, from the other side, so please tell your side of the company why you <laughs> came in contact with me, and that's how yes. we met in DTS. Yes. But uh, yeah, sure. So you know, it, it's a uh, it's an interesting interesting story when it comes to the 
founding of the company. And there's also, I would say, three generations represented uh, in the founding team of the company, which uh, brings its own opportunities and challenges at the same time. But, I'm missing uh, one generation, I guess, then. I yeah, <laughs> almost. Yeah, there's an in-between one. So <laughs> for, for each of us, other than Paul, who already knew about this solution for a very long time, way before we ever had had um, you know the wisdom to pay attention to something like this, um, we each, with Jane, Martha, and myself, took our independent journeys into identifying mineralization as the solution that we were just shocked by how little attention it was receiving, given the potential that was evident in some of the scientific literature that was available on the topic. So we each spent first separately and then together several months reading to hundreds and hundreds of papers, both looking at mineralization and all kinds of other solutions when it comes to decarbonization, and in particular, carbon removal and permanent sequestration. And we wanted to, you know, the solution that we would start to work on to pass through the filter of, you know, the science not being a question mark anymore. So you can take on technical risk, but you shouldn't take on scientific risk. We wanted to be part of kind of trying to scale up something that has a chance of reaching a very significant carbon impact within 10, 15 years. Uh, mineralization was definitely there. At the same time, it would have to be based on cheap and abundant raw materials, which mineralization is. It cannot be very energy intensive because that can, there's a, tricky question with the opportunity cost of deploying energy into decarbonization or carbon capture or carbon removal versus all the other use cases that it has for decarbonizing the rest of the industry. Um, and at the same time, optimally, of course, the whole process would turn the CO2 into something of value and demand on a very large scale that would allow you to build a business engine around the, the core process. CO2 mineralization in an industrial setting fulfills that criteria as, as well. You're producing existing products on a very large scale, but instead of <laughs> losing part of your product in turn, as a CO2 molecule, you can sequester the CO2 into your product and get a larger material flow. And finally, um, we wanted to be sure that this is an activity that can result in a truly net neg CO2 negative um, activity, like looking at the whole supply chain, upstream, downstream scopes one, two, and three, um, we did not want to start working on a solution that seemed like a good idea on a first glance, but while you really start looking into it, you realize that the net effect on the planet would be negative. So um, after a number of expert interviews and some paper reading, uh, we realized that this is really the topic that we would all like to work on. And we were lucky uh, to have discovered Paul and to be able to join forces uh, with Paul and really try and bring our backgrounds in company building and financing into a more rapid scale up of this technology. And of course, that was lacking from my side, being honestly, being a solitude business for more than a decade. So uh, I was happy that we have a team and we got some more funding and we get scaled things up in the ETS. So that was, uh, yeah. Excellent. Um, thank you both for that. It's great to understand a little better the specifics of, 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 of where the company um, sprang from. Um, just one quick, a little bit of a audible question. Um, we were talking before the we opened up the Zoom about about the carbon removal sector in Finland, where Andreas is based. Um, we've had a number of uh, this is CDR presenters from Finland, from Solitaire, the uh, indoor DAC company, to um, to uh, to Puro. Um, we've booked uh, Carbo Culture for January, which is a really innovative biochar company based in Finland. Um, Andreas, can you talk a little bit about the sector in Finland? I think it's really interesting, and also maybe the the recent law that was passed. And, and how you see that um, you, that policy shaking out. Sure. Yeah. So for context, there was a, um, you know, it, it became also publicly known that Finland has a target to be carbon neutral by 2035 and carbon negative right after that, which I think qualifies as either the most ambitious or one of the most ambitious carbon targets uh, in, in the world. Um, when it comes to the whole sector of climate tech and, and clean tech in Finland, there's a long history of uh, of heavy industry. There's a long history of clean tech, um, and there is a very kind of recently booming um, startup scene um, and venture capital scene. And I think you know you can get as philosophical as you want, but probably a big reason for why a lot of people in this country happen to work on these particular problems is that the society functions very well. You know, all the basic needs are are taken care of because you're working in in a Nordic country. Um, and people probably feel that they have more of a safety net to start taking some of these even bigger bets. 
arguably starting a company in any shape or form is a big risk and a big leap into the unknown. Starting a company that involves, you know, heavy machinery, capex, uh, long uh, lead times, long sales cycles, you know, something that is arguably slow moving and trying to build up something from the ground up is an even bigger risk. So, you know, th there's a good starting point for doing that. And obviously, you know, there's a, there's a very incredibly communal uh, and mutually helping culture within the climate tech space with, uh, in Finland, where everyone is extremely eager um, uh, to, to, to help each other out to get going. That maybe answers some parts of your question, yeah. but not, not no, all. No, it's of great. Them. It's great. I mean, we have a very, um, I would say, geographically heterogeneous audience. So it's always like good to, and, and, and you know, a surprising number of carbon removal companies come out of Finland per capita basis. So it, it's very cool to hear and learn a little bit more about the, the ecosystem there. Um, back to Pebble, though. Um, so can you break down, so per ton of CO2 feedstock, how much mineral olivine or other mineral input is needed to sequester a ton of co2 and what is the mass of the resulting um output oh, let me ask, that? Yeah. yeah that's an easy that's an easy one indeed yes okay. uh, let's say Thank for you. every ton of co2 we need two tons of olivine and we make three tons of end product okay so, so that's, that's the ratio but then people are looking at the megaton and gigaton scale i always say we need to revert the question because we're making a product for a client First, for paper mill or concrete factory. So, we have to ask how much is demand is for this material right. and then calculate back how much CO2 we need. Okay. So, that's kind of how you're going to think about it. That's kind of leads into my next question. Just the volumes that you'll be dealing with as you scale um, are immense. So, you, the way you're going to think about it is you're going to get an order from a material provider, basically, and then you will fulfill that by, by sequestering CO2. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's practically. We, sorry. No. Um, yeah, so kind of the task for us as a company is to prepare both of those sides at the same time. We need to demonstrate the integration to the source of CO2. And at the same time, we need to prepare the market and generate the demand uh, and, and, you know, make the market adoption ready for taking an alternative material that is sometimes chemically identical and morphologically identical to the one that they're currently using. But, you know, it's still a lot of work to do that, do that sales work and that convincing and get all the contracts there. And, you know, sometimes there might be some small changes into the recipe of how you manufacture that particular product. You have to work through those iteration cycles. So it's literally kind of a matching function that you have to provide. But we think that it will be a completely integral part of the company that you, from the very beginning, integrate the supply and the demand at the same time. And, and, and it, you know, recently, it was, I think somebody on Twitter said that, you know, ultimately carbon removal companies are logistics companies. And again, like recapping those numbers. So if you're going to sequester, let's call it a million tons of CO2, um, you're going to be moving 2 million tons of mineral feedstock from somewhere to a place where CO2 is being captured. And then you're going to be moving 3 million tons of resulting material from that place to your customer. Um, that's a lot. I mean, that's a lot of trucks, you know, or a lot of trains or however you like, how do you think about that? Um, do you have that experience in the company? Um, you know, when you look at a lot of carbon removal startups, that experience is not in the company. So like, how do you get that like massive logistics experience into a, a early stage carbon removal company? Because, you know, if you're successful, you're going to need to be moving those, you know, that volume of material this decade. Mm, yeah, it's it's a great question. And obviously for us, when it comes to, you know, planning the deployment and prioritizing deployment areas, there's going to be a couple of different or a couple of layers of data that together form the most attractive areas uh, of, of deployment. And one of those is existing infrastructure and vicinity to the silicate mineral sources. For us, it, it probably is so that it makes more sense to integrate at the source of CO2 and ship the input minerals rather than vice versa. But there, there's a couple of interesting opportunities when you think about, for instance, capturing carbon from cement plants that are already producing cement. You could easily create a local closed loop. So by shipping in the silicate mineral, which then would take care of the CO2 and feed into the material that they would have to ship out anyway. And then literally you're only just doing a substitution. You substitute the shipping in of lime with shipping and silicate minerals, but the out, outbound logistics and downstream logistics are exactly the same. And you, you know, environmental permitting and zoning and all kinds of those things like that are already in place. Same thing goes for paper. 
you can capture the CO2 from a paper mill, turn it into the mineral that they put into the paper product that is then finally shipped out. So local closed loops are available uh, in some cases. In others, you might even be able to build additional DAC uh, direct air capture capacity on those same sites to further push down the CO2 footprint with an honest calculation uh, or from that perspective um, to, to get further towards carbon neutrality or a carbon, like truly carbon, fully net negative um, end product. And uh, beyond that, you know, it, it's going to be an optimization question. The silicate minerals, you can find them almost on every single continent. And it, it's a question of locating close enough to those sites. And if not, you you want to prioritize shipping and waterways for, for the transportation of these minerals. But it's, you know, there's two ends. There's the, there's the silicon, oh, actually not two, there's three uh, kind of <laughs> angles, the triangle. There's the silicon minerals, there's the CO2, and then there's the consumption spot of the material. Yeah. So, you know, it's a known optimization question how to do that. Got it. And, we, I, and, we, and we're already talking, let's say, to companies which are used to handling these amounts of material. Paper industry in, in Europe is already using 6 million tons of lime to make paper. And of course, as you know, the concrete industry is much, much bigger than ATS. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I can't express to what degree the, the idea of, of your, that you just talked about of, of co-locating the actual capture with the end use uh, in the case of concrete, for example, is music to open air ears. Um, Chris, maybe you can put some links into the chat of some of the, the Four Corner Carbon Coalition um, RFP that's focused on DAC plus or carbon removal plus concrete and some of the other uh, work that we've done on that. But I mean, that that's a that's a great answer and super exciting to, to hear that you're thinking that way. Um, just a couple more questions from us. And again, please, audience, if you have questions for um, Andreas and Paul, please put those in the chat. Um, uh, can you talk just like, let's, let's, let's scope out a little bit and, and 2030 and, um, you know, where, if, if you're successful, where do you see yourselves in 2030 from a deployment perspective? Like, what is your scale looking like? How big is your company? Um, what, how do you see your, you know, are you going to be in, do you feel like your future is going to be this sort of distributed deployment? Do you think it's going to be more centralized? Like what's your vision for the next five, six, seven years? Paul, do you mind if I jump in? No, no, please take the yeah. yes. So I will so, answer later. You know, the answer to that question, you always have to balance it a little bit because depending on who you talk to, um, you want to calibrate the level of outrageous ambition that you have in your plans. And there's, you know, every single debt company and ev almost every decarbonization company is targeting a gigaton in terms of scale of operation. We know that from the availability of feedstock or energy requirement or the fundamental kind of scaling limitations perspective, a gigaton isn't impossible, but it's a damn big amount of atoms to be moved around so i don't think honestly we're going to be at a gigaton in 2030 that's just not going to happen uh what we're doing right now is after we have built the first continuously operating pilot plant which should be hopefully ready by the end of next year and fully operational after that we're hoping to be on a scaling trajectory of 10xing our capacity every 18 to 24 months roughly if we manage to do that that is already you know in the top decile probably of industrial scale up um and then at some point once you hit 10 million tons of 100 million tons uh, of global operation per year you start to hit certain limitations to how fast you can build up new capacity and it will probably taper off a little bit yeah. but to to kind of maybe be a little bit more concrete to your question about where to be in 2030 we would certainly hope to have the first couple of full industrial scale plants operational uh, and up and running I won't put an exact megaton uh, number target over here, but you know we're all working um, under time pressure because of where we are with the planet. So we're going to be scaling up as fast as reasonably possible while still building reasonable, safe, and well-functioning technology. And, and one, 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 one last other quick commercial question. Um, you know, we, we've done a lot of as. A, activist market development, trying to put these things together. How have you found the receptivity of industry to this kind of idea? Like the, the paper industry, the concrete industry, these are old, ancient, entrenched industries um, that maybe aren't necessarily thinking first about climate. How have you found their openness to the idea, hey, we want to put a direct air capture facility next to your um, paper plant and replace one of your existing inputs with a, a you know, a carbon negative uh, input. Um, like, do are people open to that? Like, how do you have that conversation? And and what is the reaction that you've kind of found in, in that sort of customer marketplace been? 
we can probably paint a picture over a longer period of time because Paul can answer for the past 15 years uh, <laughs> and I can answer for the past year. <laughs> Okay, then I will start. Let's say historically, it was bad. It was bad convincing companies to change things. It C2 prices were very low. Uh, innovation was very low. And for paper, with all due respect, this is merely a drop in replacement. So as a physicist guy, I always said, how difficult can it be? You have one type of white powder called lime. You make your own white powder and you add that in DTS. But it was very tough until, let's say, I think two, three years ago, you were seeing climate change higher on the agenda and also more people are realizing that you need to substitute, you need to change your business, that if you keep running your business like you did the last 30 years, you will be out of business. Sometimes it is hard because let's say we are cross-sectoral. That means we're not fitting into their core DNA. If you talk to the paper industry, their main concern is CO2 emissions from evaporating water. Having other feedstock is not typically the main consideration, but uh, it is changing very dramatically the last, let's say, two, three years in DTS. So please uh, explain the last year, Andreas. Uh, there's a big difference, let's say, compared to 10 years ago, that's for sure. That's Yeah, I mean, we're uh, the rest of us are incredibly lucky compared to Paul. We were just sailing in tailwinds uh, in that sense that, you know, we're, we're coming with a solution uh, into almost every single conversation with an industrial partner uh, to a problem that everyone has. Uh, everyone needs to take care of their CO2. They're hurting one way or another from their CO2 emissions or from the total CO2 footprint of their material. Uh, so, and that can either be in the form of actually enforced regula regulation-based um, fees in the form of a carbon tax. In Europe, there's the ETS system. In different countries, there are different systems. And in some, some cases, it is literally pressure from their stakeholders, employees, board, uh, shareholders, um, you know, the the wind is definitely going uh, one way only with this with this particular. And, you know, it's it's been quite easy. The bottleneck is definitely not the receptivity towards deploying technologies like this, but rather just the time that it takes to scale up these technologies and get them operational. And that's it. Even, even the funding doesn't really seem to be a problem. It's literally the time it takes to do good engineering, uh, prove certain things. And you know, uh, source the equipment. And, and are you finding any commercial pain points? Like, uh, you know, is calcium oxide expensive for paper? Has it become more expensive, or like, you know, are these materials so abundant that that's not really an issue? There's uh, one interesting use case in uh, within concrete. Obviously, within concrete or within cement, uh, you know, everyone has been scrambling scrambling for alternatives to Portland cement because of its carbon footprint. And there are natural pozzolans, there are steel slags, there are fly ashes, there are all kinds of things coming into the market. Many of those, you know, materials that are alternative cementitious or supplementary cementitious materials that they're called are based on, you know, industrial processes that are going to be phased out, like fly ashes and steel slags. Uh, which has made the cement companies increasingly, though slowly, realize that they are in trouble and they have to find substitutes if they're you know, not going to die of, of CO2 pricing. And there, that has resulted in a huge increase in price for other alternative cementitious materials like microsilica, for instance, which is fairly close to, to the product that we can be making where the price is, you know, it, it's only going one way. Got it. Um, that's great. Um, one last question from us, and then um, we would love to uh, start tackling some of these audience questions, which are looking really good. So please continue to share those. Um, um, you mentioned, you know, as part of your um, talking about your 2030 vision, like, you know, just it takes time to build um, infrastructure. Good. You mentioned SAFE, which I was really glad to hear. Um, at Open Air, we think a lot about how, you know, collectively we can build a just and equitable carbon removal industry at a global scale um, and to replace an extractive and unjust fossil carbon sector, um, or partially. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you think about equity and environmental justice and how you're factoring these considerations into deployment? Like how, like, well, how do you, like, how's the company, you know, because on the one hand, you can think like, well, we're not hurting anyone. We're not doing anything, but you're running a bunch of trucks. Like there are a lot of things happening with your processes that do offer some like, you know, potential negative externality to surrounding communities, et cetera. So how do you think about that? And how does that factor into the way you think about you're going to deploy your, your, your company? Yeah, so there's there's the negative externalities and the positive externalities to consider. Positive externalities being primarily local wealth creation and, and things like that. So for us, it's certainly a consideration. And given the fact that our feedstocks are found practically on every single continent, including very much multiple countries in the global south, now this is you know speaking 
from the perspective of where we are based as a company, which is Northern Europe. Um, you know, you, you can find them everywhere. You will also find CO2 everywhere. You will find both industrial sources of CO2 and atmospheric CO2 everywhere, literally. Um, you will also find very suitable areas for renewable energy deployment in a lot of the Global South companies. So we would like to take a kind of, or and are taking a kind of positivist approach and trying to identify places where we can contribute to positive local externalities in deploying this technology, including countries in the Global South. But we're certainly starting by deploying these technologies and paying the high development costs in the global north where we are operating where there's also a high willingness to pay for the development and scale up early scale up stages of these particular technologies but we do think that kind of building rebuilding one component of the industrial base and changing from carbon emitting to carbon storing raw materials and commodities is a huge opportunity for wealth creation job creation uh, you know, centers of excellence around the globe on, on this particular topic. So it is uh, very much in our thinking. I think it would be irresponsible for it not to be there. Great. Good answer. And glad to hear that. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Mega, who is going to um, start asking some of these audience questions. Mega, there you go. Yeah, great. I actually wanted to start with one that, Paul, I think you answered in the Q&A, but it would just be interesting, I think, for other people to hear. So yes. the person is asking, um, can the solution you have be integrated into existing facilities or is it going to be put into a newly built ones? Uh, let's say the preference is existing solutions because, like we just explained from the mass balance, you have one ton of CO2, you need to ship in two tons of olive oil and you ending up three tons of product. So having a client which is already shipping in three tons of lime at this moment and replacing his lime shipments makes more sense. The only disadvantage is, of course, typically these plants already have the power plant. So then you use the CO2 of their power plant as a CO2 source, not the deck unit or the biogenic CO2. So in that respect, but we can integrate with their loading station, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. And I think that maybe leads into another one we had, which is, uh, you know, maybe it's a semantics question, but do you count all of these processes as CCS or CDR? Because it's <laughs> sort of it is you can think from a point source. Yeah. Somebody that, but, uh, uh, that's something, let's say we are partially CCS because yeah, we need a we need to see two in a pipeline. And if the pipeline is fed with deck unit or biogenic or a power plant is from the process area, uh, you're not depending. So in that respect, we are CCS, but of course, most CCS is CO2 as a waste and storing CO2, and we are adding value. So therefore, we are CCUS. And if we use, we would like to use as much as possible deck, deck CO2 or biogenic CO2. So then we're footing in the C, CDR community. So we are in both sides, but it makes things quite difficult to be not on one box in DTS. That, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, makes sense. And then uh, the same person actually asked, uh, could you give us any further info on the tech behind your mineralization units? Is it DAC? Is it facilitating a water gas shift? Uh, you know, in the reaction conditions no. of something else? Yes, uh, let's say uh, I have quite some scientific publications that there's more detailed and explained, and I'm sure, and uh, so Dari already present in the audience, so he, he can explain it better also. Now, let's say what we're using is uh, the process runs at higher pressure, higher temperatures. So we're using existing equipment of the oil and gas industry as they got this equipment. And it is not water shift. It is, uh, we dissolve the CO2 into the water, pressurize this whole system, mix the minerals to that, add some additives, and there the reaction proceeds naturally, but then given the temperature and pressure much, much faster. And then we take out the samples, the, the, the material. So it is, yeah, existing equipment, but then a bit modified indeed, that's, uh, yeah. Got it. Um, okay, and then uh, in terms of the pilot project, uh, what what kind of like purity of CO2 needs to be uh, fed in and what other feedstocks, if any, are needed for the process? I think you mentioned some. Uh, the purity will be, let's say, around 8% of CO2. Uh, the lower values is uh, being honestly a bit of pity because, yeah, we need to compress this whole gas. And if the gas is inert, we need to spend energy on compressing this inert gas. And also it consumes reactor volume. But we don't need like uh, quite some other applications, bone dry, 99.999% CO2 in DTS. So therefore we are more reluctant about that. Uh, the quantity is we will need something like 20 to 50 kilograms of CO2 per hour, which uh, I think is on the upscaling of most deck pilot plants at this moment. But of course, not Climeworks. Climeworks is much bigger than DTS. So that's, uh, yeah. 
Got it. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, just talking a little bit more about like the stages of commercialization. Um, you mentioned that you pro you tested a batch process and are you're developing a continuous process. So, how where are those in like the in the sort of laboratory versus pilot versus deployment phase? Uh, those two types of processes. They are in a pilot phase, so uh, we are building these pilot facilities. And as you can imagine, I just said 20 to 50 kilograms of CO2 per hour. If you even if you put 100 or 200 hour, uh, euros per hour, uh, sorry, per, per, per ton of CO2 to that, you can see it's not commercial at this moment in DTS. So really at scaling up technology, uh, pilot scale, not at the lab, because we also want like to give people hundreds of kilograms of material to test it within their concrete, within their paper. So we truly at pilot scale indeed. That's uh, yeah. Maybe Paul, it's good to to kind of complete the picture from the batch operation yes. side, so that where people understand it's it's no longer at a, at a lab scale. It's no. not also not on a benchtop scale, but it has been proven in a, in an even bigger scale. And Paul, uh, in an earlier collaboration with the University, University of Aachen, which I think Dario is representing uh, in in the audience potentially, this kind of a mineralization process or version of it has been operated in a large two thousand liter batch uh, reactor. Uh, what we're yeah. going to have in-house is one small five liter batch um, high pressure vessel and a larger one, uh, which is 500 liters. So we'll be definitely producing at much higher than lab scales, even in the batch reaction. But from an engineering and scalability perspective, if the real transition is just the change of operating principle from batch operation to a continuous flow operation where you just hold, have a whole new set of problems to deal with. Okay, got it. Um, and then on, on like the commercialization side a little bit. So someone asked, uh, is there a market for just the mineralizing side of thing, even if you're not putting the products into things like concrete? Um, are you are, is Pebble able to gain carbon credits, for example, or how does that side of things work? Well, the 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 world of carbon credits is a bit of a wild west right now, as everyone knows, and you know no one knows how it's really going to work. In a way, uh, we know that we will be able to you know, claim some CDR revenue, but did, that will be if we are integrating with direct air capture or taking care of biogenic CO2. And in that case, a, a significant chunk of that carbon sequestration revenue would have to go to the company doing the actual capturing part. But for them, for them to actually qualify for that credit, they need to permanently take care of the CO2 and we can provide that particular part. So yes, there is a potential for that, but it's actually a pity not to put the material into use where you where you can achieve a secondary carbon savings and actual avoided emissions through the deployment of the same technology. So we're certainly going to be active in both, but we do know that if our projections are correct, we you know the business is viable even without any carbon revenue if you sell the output material into these certain applications. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. And then on the funding side. Um, you know, what kind of investors are in this space? Uh, this person asked, are you in touch with large investors like uh, Morgan Stanley, um, since they have a green energy venture? But like, wh who are you seeing be interested in uh, in investing in this space? I'll so leave far, to complete the deal, Andreas. I'll leave to complete the deal. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Um, so far, we've taken a conscious choice to only work with uh, investors that are fully aligned uh, in terms of climate and, and the mission that the company is on. Um, and that has led us to work with private investors, early stage venture capital funds and early stage family offices that are, you know, really dedicating themselves to to commercializing and bringing these kinds of solutions into the world going forward. And when when we start raising larger rounds, hopefully we have reason to do so while we're scaling up the technology, we would be moving more towards, you know, larger, more typical VC, private equity, potentially different kinds of non-dilutive funding instruments like debt financing, project financing. Uh, and then it would move closer to the banks and other kinds of financial institutions. But that's there. That's on the on the you know private funding side. Of course, the other side is uh, public subsidies, grants, all kinds of programs that you can qualify for while deploying these kinds of technologies. And we're uh, going into those processes right now. Got it. Okay. Cool. Makes sense. Um, we talked a little bit about you know, what's going to happen in the next few years, 2030. Um, I'd love to know, where do you see kind of the biggest differences in the way things operate today versus what you expect in 2030? And that could be in the economics of it, the technology, the the partners you work with, um, what's kind of set as it is and what's likely to change a lot? I think from a, let's say, technical innovation point of view, much more interest in uh, paper mills, in concrete manufacturers to use these novel products in DTS. That was in the past uh, a bit of hassle getting them involved in DTS, so that will make a sure a big influence. 
I think also in the uh, public, people want to buy more sustainable products. So therefore, let's say buying this kind of paper is sure helps. Uh, I think also the policy support that uh, will be more, there's more funding, let's say, for these high risk novel, de novel developments, but also there is more buying power of people wanting to buy these materials. So in that respect, yeah, things are changing much faster. The uh, problems we are facing a bit is that we are cross-sectoral. If you're talking to the paper industry, they say, okay, we just buy line. Why should we buy your material? And then some discussions about the C2 credits, but I think that can be solved. So, uh, yeah, things are moving much, much faster compared to in the past. And, uh, yeah, you see, especially the youth, more sensible to, yeah, not doing less bad, but doing more good in DTS. So you can make concrete and still pour a house and build a house and pour concrete and then by sequestering CO2 instead of emitting less CO2. And also what you are noticing is more attention for permanent CO2 removal. This whole community started, let's say, with uh, planting lots of trees, which should absolutely happen. But I'm sure you heard about uh, quite some disaster with trees in DTS. But in addition to trees, we should have this more novel type of the technical buy style type of thing. In the past, there was a big distance between the nature-based solutions and the technical-based solutions. And technical-based solutions were less considered. Uh, I remember the discussions with Deck and the discussion with Howard Herzog that the very low C2 concentration in the air wouldn't make sense. You, you should first start with the power plants. And now you see 10 years down the road, you see the power plants shutting down to economic reasons, not competing with solar and with wind anymore. So therefore, going for that makes more sense. So yeah, there's a big difference in happening in DTS. It's, uh, Maybe Paul, yeah. to, to, to yeah. summarize some of those other things, how it's going to look like for our particular technology. So there are economies of scale to be achieved yeah. in, in scaling up this technology, which means more favorable supply terms. Uh, you know, certain advantages that you get from just a, you know, higher output volume per unit time per certain footprint by building larger plants. And hopefully by 2030, we'll be at a point where we have multiple uh, of those larger plants where we can actually achieve very reasonable uh, mineralization or CO2 sequestration costs while producing materials that we have already secured market demand for. So, you know, the there are no reasons why the why the techno economic and the cost base uh, of the technology shouldn't be in a much better place naturally while you're still working with first of a kind plants everything is more expensive it takes money and time to make those expensive mistakes and really understand kind of what the optimal solutions to different technical problems are but once you are at a at a point where well, you're just replicating plants you can realize likely quite significant savings yeah, yeah. And the more, let's say, DEC is scaling up, the more their technology develops, the cheaper the CO2 can be sourced. So that also helps us in DTS. And it's like explained, it's a pity to store the CO2 subsurface while you can use it to make it into a product which is permanently removing CO2. Yeah. Um, just a couple more before we go. Um, so in terms of the policy side of things, what incentives are available in Finland or for EU for end use of these kinds of materials uh, like concrete that helps de drive demand for the products and what kind of other incentives or other policies in general would be helpful for you? There's a, I think from, from our perspective, you know, we're a pan-European company, so we're looking at this very much like pan-European meaning that our team happens to be situated across uh, a number of different European countries. So we're very much looking at this from a European perspective. The EU has a number of different products uh, and programs in place that help make decarbonization a viable reality and possibility, both for the industry and for carbon removal. Um, there are a number of programs and subsidy programs that are also being prepared and a more comprehensive approach to carbon removal how do you verify how like what sorts of prereq requirements do you set uh, for carbon removal to qualify as really high quality carbon removal also from the perspective of the legislators and the European Union and its various different bodies on national levels the subsidies vary quite a bit um, and it's typically uh, on a case by case basis but almost every single country that we have looked at has national subsidies or regional subsidies available for the demonstration of new green or climate or decarbonization technologies so there there's a multitude of options here i'm just not going to start listing all the different project names uh on here 
Great. Um, last one before we go. Uh, if people in the audience are interested in, you know, learning more, supporting uh, what you guys do, um, what's the best thing that people can do to kind of help see this technology move forward? Apply for a job. I simply yes. that. <laughs> that's that's the that's the best thing where we need to hire for quite a bit of people i said we're eight at this point by the end of next year we're going to be somewhere between 20 and 25 um good talent uh is always in demand and for people um, especially people who have realized that this is the thing that they really want to work on and want to put their skills into use uh, on a project like this which we think qualifies as one of the kind of definitely in in the top set of solutions that are viable and there's a reasonable path to be seen for this to actually scale up and provide a very significant carbon impact we would be very happy to hear from you perfect um well thank you guys so much for joining us and uh toby i'll give us back to you to finish things up thanks guys for being here thanks for having us Hello again. Yeah, I was trying to find a jobs link on your site. Is there something that you could put in the chat that, um, like, uh, we put sure. your website and see an actual career link? Uh, there's just it's very simple. Carriers at pebble.com. I just put it in the uh, put it in the chat so people can pick it up from there. Cool. Other than that, if you you know if that doesn't work, you can always go to uh, yeah. Actually, if you click on the careers link in the screen that you're sharing, it should open up an email box. If it doesn't work, just email hello at pebble.com and that uh, that should work quite well. Okay, perfect. Um, well, listen, thank you guys both very much for being with us. Uh, super exciting to learn more about what you're doing and, and can't wait to, to watch you progress and get out in the world. Um, and we'd love to be a part of uh, Be Helpful. So we will be sending ideas. And Andreas, as mentioned, I think Chris will be following up about a new uh, CDR policy mission in Finland. Um, be exciting to get that started in 2023. So thank you for being with us. Absolutely. And thanks, Christopher, for sending a link that is probably going to be directly useful for us. Uh, we noted it down in the chat. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right. Just a few quick programming notes as soon as my um, screen loads. Um, we have a very exciting uh, close to the This is CDR calendar um, coming up next week. Uh, Brilliant Planet, um, Dr. Rafael Jovin, who has been working on algae for many, many years um, and has been working on this idea of, of growing algae in a desert environment and then sequestering it, and again, in this dry desert environment for carbon removal. Um, He's, he's, he's an amazing, amazing guy, and, and he's going to be presenting um, next Tuesday. I, I put a link, it might have gotten buried, but it's in the um, chat. Um, and so we'd love to see you uh, with us then. Um, thank you again to, uh, to Andreas and Paul for being with us. Thank you to the audience for, for um, spending some time with us today. I hope you enjoyed the program. Um, and thanks to Megan and Chris for, for helping put it on. Um, everyone be well. Um, we will see you next week.